the group. Mr. Farage. Good morning. Good morning. Funny, isn't it? Funny, isn't it? Thank you very much for that. Very warm welcome. Um, how things have changed. Just a second, Mr. Farish. Ladies and gentlemen, one major quality of democracy is that you listen to those even if you don't share their opinion. Well, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? And the reason you're so upset, the reason you're so angry, has been perfectly clear from all the angry exchanges this morning. You, as a political project, are in denial. You're in denial that your currency is failing. You're in denial... Well, just, well, just look at the Mediterranean. No, no, no. As a, as a policy to impose poverty on Greece and the rest of the Mediterranean, you've done very well. And you're in denial over Mrs. Merkel, Mrs. Merkel's call last year for as many, any people as possible to cross the Mediterranean into the European Union has led to massive divisions between countries and within countries. But the biggest problem you've got and the reason, the main reason the United Kingdom voted the way that it did is you have, by stealth, by deception, without ever telling the truth to the British or the rest of the peoples of Europe, you have imposed upon them a political union. You've imposed upon them a political union. And when the people in 2005 in the Netherlands and France voted against that political union, when they rejected the constitution, you simply ignored them and brought the Lisbon Treaty in through the back door. What happened? What happened last Thursday was a remarkable result. It was indeed a seismic result, not just for British politics, for European politics, but perhaps even for global politics too. Because what the little people did, what the ordinary people did, what the people who, who have been oppressed over the last few years and seen their living standards go down, they rejected the multinationals. They rejected the merchant banks. They rejected big politics. And they said... Actually, we want our country back. We want our fishing waters back. We want our borders back. We want to be an independent, self-governing, normal nation. And that is what we have done. And that is what must happen. And in doing so, and in doing so we now offer a beacon of hope to Democrats across the rest of the European continent. I'll make one prediction this morning. The United Kingdom will not be the last member state to leave the European Union. So the question, the question is, what do we do next? Now, it is up to the British government to invoke Article 50. And I have to say that I don't think we should spend too long in doing it. I totally agree, uh, Mr Juncker, that the British, British people have voted. We need to make sure that it happens. But what I would like to see is a grown-up and sensible attitude to how we negotiate a different relationship. Now, now I, know, I know that virtually none of you have ever done a proper job in your lives <laughs> or, worked, or worked in business or worked in trade or indeed ever created a job. But listen, just listen. The fact that you're claiming nobody has done uh, a decent job in their life, you can't really say that. I'm sorry. No, you're quite, uh, you're quite right, Mr. Schultz. UKIP used to protest against the establishment, and now the establishment protests against UKIP. So something has happened here. Let us listen to some simple, pragmatic economics. We, between us, 
between your countries and my country, we do an enormous amount of business in goods and services. That trade is mutually beneficial to both of us. That trade matters. If you were to decide to cut off your noses, to spite your faces, and to reject any idea of a sensible trade deal, the consequences would be far worse for you than it would be for us. And I, even, even no deal is better for the United Kingdom than the current rotten deal that we've got. But if we were to move to a position where tariffs were reintroduced on products like motor cars, then hundreds of thousands of German workers would risk losing their jobs. So why don't we just be pragmatic, sensible, grown up, realistic, and let's cut between us, let's cut between us a sensible tariff free deal and thereafter, and thereafter recognize that the United Kingdom will be your friend, that we will trade with you, we will cooperate with you, we will be your best friends in the world. But do that, do it sensibly, and allow us to go off and pursue our global ambitions and future. Thank you. The London stock market is rallying strongly this morning. It is now 12% up since its February lows. Sterling is weak, but then it started declining from July 2014. And the Prime Ministers of Australia and New Zealand are now vying for who can be the first country from outside the EU to do a trade deal with the United Kingdom. Things are looking pretty good. The only upheaval is political upheaval, where we've seen a Prime Minister resign and indeed the British Commissioner, Lord Hill, resigned. They've both done so, I think, for the right reasons. You never know, we may be getting rid of a Labour Party leader as well. But upheavals in politics can actually be a very healthy and a very good thing. Uh, and I got into politics because our political class in Britain led us towards a European political project. So if that result last week sweeps a few of them away, so be it. But I am looking forward next year to celebrating our Independence Day on June the 23rd.